Welcome to the first webinar of our 2021 series, 2022 and beyond. Thank you so much for joining for today's topic, The Only Way to Get Things Done is in Teams, a discussion about practical collaboration. As professionals working in healthcare, none of us are strangers to the power of collaboration to achieve more than we could individually and its power to overcome barriers and drive meaningful results for our businesses. As Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And here we find ourselves mid pandemic with a unique opportunity to leverage a key point of reassessment. Be behaviors have changed, people are doing things differently. And now is the time to grasp collaboration and identify the dynamics that most need our attention. Before we dive in today, I would very much like to encourage you to think about these four questions while listening to our presentation and discussion. What excites you? What concerns you? What you'd like to know more about? And what ideas do you have? And please feel free to pop these questions, ideas and thoughts in our chat so that our speakers can answer these questions towards the end of the session. So we are very honored and excited to have three thought leaders for today's webinar. Please let me first introduce Alison James, founder of Ampidextrous, Alison is an experienced facilitator and trainer across the full suite of business and commercial capabilities, known for her strong strategic thinking skills, coupled with real tactical expertise. She loves to share best practice and create innovative and immersive capability programs. Alison brings a wealth of industry experience, having held senior commercial positions in both client and agency side across multiple categories and in multiple geographies. Secondly, let me introduce you to Dave McCorkin, founder of Bibliosexual. Dave has over 30 years experience in marketing and advertising. He is a brilliant speaker, consultant, strategy planner, and well-seasoned market researcher. His interest and passion get towards sustainability, people, including aging markets, and the future of consumer healthcare. He is an amazing storyteller, which will, you will, of course, find out very soon. Last but not least, I would like to introduce you to Steve Sowerby, founder of Expotential and co-founder of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. Steve has a strong background in consumer healthcare and is a highly experienced marketer and general manager with over 30 years of corporate and agency experience. With his belief that people are the most important resource in the organization, for over 15 years, he has been invited to speak and train companies around the world in both healthcare and non-healthcare industries. Thank you so much for hosting today. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our speakers for today, Alison, Dave, and Steve. Thank you very much, Emma, and uh, welcome to everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, I know we are all hoping that this year will be better than 2020, uh, different from 2020, and hopefully we can all look forward to things a bit more. Uh, of course, some things have not started this year as we would hope, and I guess the realisation is that January 1st didn't mean we all went back to 2019. Things have just developed and will keep on developing. Personally, I'm trying to take a brighter outlook. Hence, every day for the, for the month of January, I'm devoting myself to wearing ridiculously bright fit shirts. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really help, but I'm trying. Um, and of course, one of the things that we learned last year, or maybe that was really just reinforced, like a lot of things last year, was helping each other get through things, uh, working together to help find solutions, to help find new ways of doing things, to get used to doing things, and then also to look for new opportunities. And I think that's why today's session is particularly important because collaboration, working in teams, figuring out how, how to be more resourceful, efficient, but also how to be more future looking and more creative by com combining efforts with others is such an important part of our business world and how we're going to be successful in the future. So it's great to have Alison with us. Um, we've had a, a couple of interesting background discussions about this. And as we go along, as always, uh, Steve and I are going to uh, interject, uh, as Alison tells us, uh, her thoughts, but we're going to interject with some examples and some, I guess, from Steve at least, deep and meaningful questions, and from me, probably 
Oh, obviously. absolutely. Well, we're, we're not shy coming forward, are we, Dave? That's one of the things that I love about uh, these conversations. And I agree with you. I think last year has been a, a, a year of major change, as you, as Emma said, uh, never waste a crisis because that really makes you think differently. And it's something that obviously is going to continue into this year. So uh, things are changing. And uh, what uh, I love about what we're going to talk with Alison about uh, over the next hour is not only are we going to talk about the the theory, but also the best practices, and more importantly, the practical applications in terms of how we can make this happen in our organizations and in our teams and with our partners. So, Alison, uh, lovely to have you here. Would you uh, would yeah. you start us off, please? Very, very excited to be here, guys, um, and excited to share something I'm super passionate about and something, as Dave said, is so in the moment um, and has been for the past few years. I think all of us will have seen articles around that externally, but we'll also have experienced it ourselves. So I'm looking forward to sharing this session with you. We've got lots of things, lots of examples to share, and we'll be looking at things across the board. So hopefully that'll give you some inspiration and some practical things to take away. So let me just share with you our agenda. So we're going to just start by talking about collaboration and I'm going to prop it up to you, uh, the three steps to heaven. And then we're going to look at why COVID makes this such a strategic imperative. And we all love key points of reassessment, but here is one. It's not that collaboration hasn't been happening. It's just that this makes it more pertinent. And then I want to introduce you to the meta model from the Let's Go team of successful collaboration. And we're gonna use that model to look at the dynamics uh, that make teams work really well. And we'll talk about that in context of a system before we open up to Q&A. So um, hopefully this will be interesting for you guys. Um, just to step back slightly and just uh, flag that um, Trevor, um, one of our other colleagues in, in their team, did a session on change and collaboration last year. So very much so we're going to build on some of the aspects that he introduced in terms of personal qualities of trust being super important to make this work and that it's really critical to drive innovation and innovation is a key growth, growth driver for nearly all businesses at the moment. But we're also going to build on that and talk about how conflicting accountabilities can also be part of collaboration because that's the reality. So as Steve said, talking about things in a practical way means that you need to work together and understand where each other is coming from. But more than anything, it's the softer skills, it's the right mindset, it's the glue that makes collaboration more possible. So really that's our springboard into kind of thinking about things or setting us up for the year. So as I mentioned, uh, my three steps to heaven, so just to keep it short and punchy. Uh, the first one is about collaboration needs to be jointly commercially beneficial and um, that will be leading us into a lovely Venn diagram that I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with is that we need to hit the sweet spot with things we do in business. Essentially we need to make sure that everything we do is desirable, that somebody wants it or needs it, that it's viable that you can make money from it and that it's feasible that you can make it We you know someone who can. So this is our context, if you like, with collaboration. We need to make sure that things work like that. And just to step us into some of the examples of uh, where this is tricky and where this didn't go so well, uh, I'll kick off with a couple of examples of where people might have got it wrong. So um, Colgate, uh, this is uh, an, uh, something that happened, I'm trying to remember, it was way back, actually. And way it's, back, yeah. It's got to be back. the 70s. It's not really the same. <laughs> um, this is a feature of the Museum of Failure in Sweden, for those of you up there. Um, so really the, the context of this actually being desirable wasn't so well rooted. Um, and therefore people found it really difficult, as you can imagine, to uh, move from the category of toothpaste to food and to accept that approach. Likewise, um, feasible. It's all about actually thinking all the way through and collaborating. So this is a, a road bike, Sinclair C5, that was simply not safe, okay? So simply could not be seen by buses. And that's why the, the launch of it didn't go so successfully. And then thirdly, under the viable banner, 
this has now superseded by people that have been able to make this work. But the early days of the health forums were really tricky and they required a lot of assistance from venture capitalists in order to make it viable. So we need mm -hmm. to be aware of these things. And you can see from that discussion that there are simple ways that that could have been alleviated. But really, those three things are super important when you're working together with a common goal. Yeah. Ali, isn't that sort of it goes back to the, the, the beginning of any great collaboration is a really clear target, a really clear challenge that everyone buys into. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, if you start with a, a very generic challenge or something which is uh, not clear in any way, you are pretty much dooming that collaboration to failure. I'm a big fan of having a how to question to kick you off. Yeah. How do we do X? But I will be coming on to talk about agile methodology where you actually need to work and learn and then adjust, adjust and adapt. But you're absolutely right. So many things that we do don't have that initial strategic question sorted. And I know, Dave, that in your world, that would be a key thing you'd spend extra time on, as I would, at the beginning of some client work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first question is, why the hell do you want to do this? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> absolutely it's really 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 critical so yeah uh, absolutely in violent agreement i think that then moving on to my second step to heaven around collaboration being a team sport and the reason i want to sort of highlight this at this point is because we've come to realize that we can't do everything and historically in the old days, you may well have been promoted based on, you know, the next person's job and the next person and the next person. And when you get to the top, you kind of know how to do everything. That's unrealistic. That's been unrealistic for a number of years. And what we're looking at is T-shaped people. People that have the broad empathy across a number of roles and a number of uh, interdependent departments, but they then have a specialism in a certain area. And therefore as a team, we start to build these struts so it becomes a ladder. And that really is something now that we're seeing probably in the last five to eight years, um, recruitment is coming up against. So we're looking for recruitment of people that have that broad, and that's where emotional intelligence comes in. That's super important to be aware of how everything fits around, but you don't need to be the expert because you can't possibly be in today's world. So this yeah. is another key thing about collaboration is is really accepting that you can't do everything but you need to work together to get that, yeah. uh, that goal assorted yes yeah. Steve. ali just on, on on that you know uh one thing that's missing for me is sometimes when we start to develop functional competency so making sure that people are really good at that functional area we forget about those broad uh uh, ability to to work in a broader area across departments uh, um, and and that tends to influence this silo thinking and and basically then it makes collaboration very difficult I one uh, experience that I've had recently is where developing functional competencies uh, the client has really made sure that there was also a competency across the broad area as well, understanding different departments, understanding the business scope, um, that kind of area makes it easier then to choose the right people for your, yeah. for your uh, successful collaboration team. Yeah, and I absolutely have seen, as many of us have, that the zigzag career is also yeah. a very good example of that, where oh, you're yeah. getting cross-functional experience. Uh, sadly, there are fewer graduate entry programs that might have facilitated that. So these days it's behoving to the individual to be proactive in their development plans to do that as well. But I, I'm with you. I've seen an awful lot of HR teams in the competency dictionaries and the breakdowns, making sure that they have that cross-functional element. And that's yeah. super important because putting yourself in someone else's shoes means that you'll do a better job collectively. Yeah. Okay, so a few examples in our world of healthcare where this happens, and just to really nail the point somewhat, is you know, if you think about um, in pharma world, the kind of classic four Ps that we talk about, where you have to consider the patient, the physician, the policymaker, and the payer. Um, so just really to demonstrate that collaboration is there immediately in your face. 
you really haven't got an excuse to be siloed and you really haven't had one for a while. What's interesting is actually how these dynamics have evolved over the years. So when we when we think about this, and I've got an example coming up where um, there was a successful collaboration, we also recognise that the um, there is a shift sort of towards the patient over the years who then kind of knows potentially what they want and then they're bringing things around. But this can differ depending on the circumstance. So just to kind of bring that to life a little bit with an example from Humira. So um, for those of you that are in the pharma world, um, I've put a little note at the bottom there of, of what this is for those that uh, uh, aren't familiar. So although I've spent a long time trying to pronounce spondylite arthritis, um, this is one of the indications for it. And what happened here, which is super useful for um, the collaboration perspective, is that in order to make this actually uh, more, more available, regulatory patient groups, insurance companies, and logistics companies got together to make a breakthrough to reduce the price. And the reason the, how they did that is they looked at doing things in bulk and using mm. what's known as bonded warehouses. For those of you, again, not familiar with that, they keep it um, in a separate place without paying all the taxes, but they can buy it then in bulk to allow that to be cost effective. And this was a direct response from an interrupted supply. So really what it really uh, did highlight is the patient perspective of how that deeply affects the mental and physical well-being. So those of you that are unlucky enough to know people that need this, it's a life-changing drug and it really does help mm. quality of life as well as longevity of life. So it's a real lovely example of in this world, those groups coming together and finding some win-wins on a simple thing of buying in bulk and logistically putting it somewhere successful for people to access. Mm. Now, that's not the only one. You know, if we're mm. talking about consumer healthcare, you know, some of the more obvious collaborations that we have to consider is the retailer and regulatory and the manufacturer. So, you know, I again want to make this point so that it lands in people's environment because part of these lovely webinars is that they are, are meant to be practical and we want to really help people think about it in their world. So the example that um, I wanted to bring out on this one is one from um, Horlex. So um, Horlex at the time was a GSK product and this is an example from India where there was a um, agenda from the um, government about actually some of the things that, that they are really important in terms of making sure that their, um, their population are well educated, that are exportable, and they have that as a personal pride. So this is an example where a particular claim that was brought to the fore from Horlex uh, was done in collaboration. And that then facilitated the taller, stronger, sharper claim which then enabled the business to really accelerate. And so a lot of us work in this area and we forget how powerful working through claims are, but obviously in order to expedite a claim, you're looking at making sure that you connect things together with various departments. So this was super successful in terms of giving that particular all win-win situation and ultimately the competitive advantage that the country was seeking. So these things can go quite high order as well as, as low. And from uh, my little sign off there, because I think it's a really good indictment is that, you know, this was a pretty strong brand, but it then sold to Unilever for a huge multiplier uh, mm -hmm. recently. Okay. So this is, a, this is kind of really telling us that collaboration can really bring a viable commercial result. And that's great. That's great for everybody. Yeah. Ali, just that uh, regulatory part uh, rings such a bell. Um, regulatory managers in many organizations are, are, are sometimes termed the no police when it comes to innovation and, yes. uh, and communication. Yeah. And that's completely wrong. They're the no police because they're brought in far too late in the process of innovation or communication. So yeah. they have to basically toe the line of regulatory and legal. Um, but if they're brought in early into the process, if you have them involved right at the beginning, almost uh, listening to the focus groups and the consumer insights and helping to develop uh, the ideas and, and the product concepts, they can really be the facilitators of much faster routes to market, much more powerful communications, and much more effective innovations. And that's something yeah, which I'm very passionate about. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Yeah, yeah Steve, to your point, uh, I'd go further. You know, I, I really believe that things like regulatory people, you bring them in at that first meeting when you're asking the question, why do you want to do this, right? Um, yeah. Because quite, uh, you know, in my experience, sometimes what happens is, is the regulatory person, you know, the marketing guy or whatever it is will say, we want to do this because we've seen that. And the regulatory person can raise the flag straight away about, yes, but you know, you'd have to do this, this and this first, right? You'd have to take these things into consideration. Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes the reality it is, it's, it's helped stop an idea, it helps stop a project right from the start when everybody's just gone, oh, so that's basically not going to work, is it? Uh, let's not waste our time any further. But as you involve them as each stage, and you're right, I mean, giving people, uh, you know, well, we've created this, now we want you to tell us we can do it, is the wrong time to do it. Right? No. You've got to be no. involved with the thinking behind it, the processes that have gone into it, et cetera, et cetera. They get their input all the time. Yeah, and I absolutely would like to build on that, Steve, because in my experience, and I, I was lucky enough to work for GSK for many years in a global role, um, uh, it's also about leveraging your strength and where you come from. So commercial people are very adept at thinking about things around the edges as well, and that's recognising one of their skills. So in my experience, getting together with the regulatory teams and creating a regulatory strategy up front actually allows you to expedite how you might get registration around the world. So the example I'll have is 36 markets going at once with a particular launch. That's not possible, but you can group markets and you can yeah. put files together that allow you to do things successfully. And, and in my experience, it was a really great collaboration because we were sort of coming from, okay, let's see how we can maybe make this more viable and have things running quicker, but also make sure that we've got all the evidence that's needed in the particular yeah. scenario. So I'm yeah, with yeah. you, is regulatory um, uh, is, is a fantastic uh, division and um, bring them up front, but then use your own skills as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to build on that, uh, there's, uh, Maria's been, uh, been uh, on our chat. Uh, I think it's a really good point she's making that We've got to be able to sort of withstand the commercial pressure of we have to be on the market now versus we have to be on the market with the best possible product or communication, even if it's one or two months uh, uh, later, but you're going to get a much bigger result as, uh, as, uh, as a result of it. So I think managing these stakeholders that are key to the development of innovation and that's part of collaboration how to bring them on board and ensure that they know believe and act to make sure that we work together to create something which is a magic and amazing yeah i'm totally with you and you know that lends it into this third demonstration of all of those cross-functional departments and you know some of these in certain organizations are individuals others are departments some might pricing for example might sit in finance or marketing or sales so it doesn't you know it doesn't matter where it sits the reality is that you also get this happening which is super important to take into consideration when you're looking at a collaboration so really early on good conversations around what you're trying to achieve and we'll come on when we talk to you about the meta model about the importance of involvement actually which which person and which department or which function needs to be involved at what stage of a collaboration makes for a better collaboration. And I've got a very small example um, of this working well between two departments coming up, slightly outside of healthcare, but as we know, are very related in terms of tech. And um, this is an Apple example, and some of you may not know this, um, because we all very, very appreciative of the vision of Steve Jobs, but actually, Robin Cook was super important in terms of the development and the success of the Apple business model. So what he did, they brought together those key departments of tech design, pricing strategy and finance and brought up a whole load of touchstream technology way before it was actually coming to, to fruition in terms of the development went ahead of that so that he could command enough supply to actually look at something very commercially viable. And that's, that's just a really nice example of bringing someone in soon enough 
and taking them along with the vision. So, you know, we all know how successful they've been. And if we look at some of the profitability, they've managed to establish quite a nice set of um, business models aligned to that. So really about don't forget any department, but kind of thinking about how that works is really important in nearly every business that we work in. And I think as well, let's not forget our last collaboration because many of us have had the joy of working across geographically. And this brings with it some fantastic opportunities to collaborate. And I know, Dave, that this is close to your heart, isn't it? Well, yeah, because that's basically what I've been doing for the last 30 years. Is, uh, <laughs> you know, I used to work for one of the globe world's biggest ad agencies for couple of decades and my job I used to joke was I was the translator not because I could speak any languages let's face it I barely speak English correctly but because my job was to literally to often to go to London New York Paris or the headquarters of some global client and basically explain look I know you want to launch this in 10 different Asian countries but you have to take on board that apart from they are all fitting geographically in the space we call Asia, they don't have much else in common. And rather than having somebody, and you, you know, quite often I, I've been involved in projects where at a, a headquarters in America or Europe, or sometimes a headquarters in, in, you know, in a central place in Asia like Singapore, there would be a team that would be to your previous three collaboration steps would bring together all the right parties, but they were the right parties at the headquarters. And they weren't actually involving the team, you know, people in each of the markets right from the beginning, okay, who could raise some flags or could point out, hey, you know, there is a local competitor who's actually doing something like that, um, which quite often would, you know, get missed by the big central teams. Yeah. The other thing that always strikes me, and I think we talked about this last week, you know, um, you know when you think about doing stuff across three or four different countries, uh, is understanding what collaboration really means in different marketplaces. And I'll give you a, a simple example. Uh, I worked for 10 years in Tokyo, in Japan, and I had been there, uh, I was the head of strategy for the, the biggest foreign ad agency in the country, we had 800 staff, but of the 800 staff, only seven were foreigners, the rest were Japanese. Now. Most of those people in typical Japanese fashion had spent their whole careers working for this American company in Japan. They were used to American style processes, etc. But six months into my uh, time in Japan, I was sitting with my three direct reports, very senior experienced Japanese managers. And we were talking about the fact that the next day for one of our largest clients, we were going to run a all day brainstorming session country president, the country marketing director of this client, half a dozen of their senior people were going to come in and I was going to have half a dozen of our most senior people and we were going to work together on a brainstorming session all day. And we spent about an hour talking about the structure of the day, how we were going to start it, what was the input, etc. And after about half an hour, and at that stage my Japanese was absolute zero, and the three Japanese gentlemen all broke down into a discussion amongst themselves and then silence and then all looked at me in silence and I, so what, what's the deal and one of them very bashfully said um dave son uh perhaps you can explain to us what why do westerners think brainstorming is useful at all um and what it really led to was a whole discussion that culturally culturally and i discovered this amongst not only my own teams mm. my own company but every japanese manager i talked to said that worked for an american company or dealt with an american company said yeah but you know brainstorming it has nothing to do with actually coming up with good ideas it's about jumping it's about jumping to things that you want to make happen not things that will make happen and it was actually about the whole cultural thing that in okay. japanese business culture brainstorming literally was laughed at internally as like that's a joke it never works it's a waste of time um, so you have to understand if you're going to bring teams together, how they can work together, what are the exercises and the tools that make sense to them, not, 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 not to me. Could, or Steve Couldn't agree or more. Right? Could not agree yeah. more. Uh, Steve, did you want to build? Well, I was going to say, I mean, this is critical, especially when we're building global brands in some of our organizations that we get the, uh, the geographies in 
to the conversation at a very, very early stage, uh, if we're talking about communication or innovation, when it's at that briefing stage, so we can make sure that the insights from the different markets are being taken into account when we build the challenge, when we understand who we're talking to. It's absolutely critical because if not, what you end up doing is creating something that is not relevant for some markets and they could be important markets and that could be a great shame. Um, uh, so I think, again, it comes to choosing that team um, when you build a collaboration team. Make sure that the people who have the right functional skills, of course, and of course, the, the element about the cross-functionality as well, but also the market and insights around the consumer in their different markets has got to be key because ultimately the brands are not built in headquarters, I'm afraid to say. The, band, the brands are built with consumers in local markets. And yeah. that's where the innovations and communications need to work. Very so true. really important, absolutely, yeah. need to understand and bring these people into the collaboration team early. And I guess one of the things that I want to highlight there, if I build on the important bit, is I'm sure people that are listening will also be thinking, how the hell do I bring in so many different people at an early stage? And I think it does depend then on the structure of what you're trying to achieve. And back to the three circles. Um, I've been working in organisations that are structured to be centralised and those that are structured to be decentralised. It really depends on the operation you're in. But it'd also be important to look at being honest with people and saying that this is not a priority for your market or this is a priority for your market. Yeah. And in my experience, that, that conversation is also part of that early one to say, we have actually have to make some strategic decisions here. And therefore this is, this is where we think is the best way to go. Let's get the input, yeah. let's agree. But I'm, I'm also um, a massive fan of that listening aspect in the context of the world has grown up differently, as you said, and, and brands are owned in consumer minds. And, and many companies find that a brand means different things in different countries. Right. So actually, what's useful as well is to be attuned to that and see whether there is a commercial opportunity by potentially tweaking something very slightly to then drive a huge change. And, you know, I think that it's all of those strategic conversations that are part of collaboration that will help you drive a portfolio forward. Yeah, I'll give you a simple yeah. example of that in, in action. I'm, I'm actually working for, I can't say the company, I'm working for one of Japan's automakers at the moment on a project, automobile makers. And everybody it, from the regional team and me and everybody else is rather surprised just before the end of last year when a piece of research revealed that in key Southeast Asian markets, more than 50% of the population don't realise this brand is Japanese. Yeah. Now, if you think about it, it's an automaker and it's Japanese. And I think probably everybody listening to this session would have automatic uh, connections between it. it's a Japanese brand, it's Japanese. That probably means X, Y, and Z. Now, that was really interesting because as it got fed up the system, it was like, how could that possibly have happened? We've been in these markets for decades and people don't realise. And it's because sometimes, of course, in the local markets, stuff is happening and we forget what the history has been built in people's minds, right? And uh, how that the history or the brand is interpreted in those local markets may not align to what we think is happening globally or happening regionally. And so yeah. sometimes you just got to just go back and ask the obvious questions, right? And, and yeah. find out. Yeah. Yes, I was going to say, and I know we're sort of uh, de uh, uh, debating this point, but I think it's really important. I think this is where COVID, the pandemic, has really made some positive impact because before, to bring these global teams together, there was always a, a budget issue. Oh, we've got to fly so-and-so in from China. We have to also bring someone in from Brazil. And oh, the cost, oh, the time that they will have away from work. Whereas now with technology, the crisis has created a change of mindset. You know, what we're doing now, probably we might have done, but it wouldn't have been so interesting uh, or, uh, or um, engaging before um, in terms of passing information. But what happens now in many organizations, 
uh, was something that we dreamed about in terms of our virtual meetings and being able to talk to someone in Beijing as easily as I talk to someone here in Bangkok. Uh, you know, so the change of mindset and openness to use technology to connect and uh, it's improving all the time. And secondly, uh, as Michael posted in the chat a little uh, while ago, um, we've got great tools. And this is developing all the time. So not only platforms like Zoom and Team and Google Meet, and what have you, but we've got Mural and Mirage, real platform uh, tools that can help us to brainstorm online in a very interactive way that can help us to effectively create innovations and creativity in a similar way. Uh, yeah. So I, I think this is another element which I think is really important we should grasp and help grow because it will help us to bring in those insights much easier from the market. So hey, I think we probably need to move on. We actually. have to move on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to stop on this example, but I'm sure everybody will be familiar with how Snickers oh, I love it. Yeah. about. Um, but I think the third step to heaven is it's a human endeavor and is more than a process. So this is this is often what people think about is follow the process and the results will come, but actually it's the glue between that as well. So we've alluded to that a little bit, but just to stick on process and just sort of quickly go through a couple of slides here, the standard process is very waterfall and sequential. We'll all have gone through this and in some occasions it works. But actually what's happened these days is that we've become much more au fait with a more collaborative, iterative approach, be that through design thinking or lean user experience, but more particularly into agile methods. And what I've seen a lot with um, clients is success through collaboration is actually adopting things like Scrum and Sprints, actually doing it in the way that makes sense for our world as opposed to the IT world. So just to sort of give you a sense, guys, of, of success that I've experienced is mm. make a big list of your jobs to be done. That's the things that you link. You're then looking at connecting those into an endeavor. That's your sprint. You're collaborating through that. And then you're keeping a stakeholder engaged, but the empowerment is in the team to make the decisions. And part of what you want to achieve is as, as a result of that. So a little increment of what you're trying to achieve. And then you review that and move on to the next piece. So it's not really rocket science. And a lot of us have been doing it already. But what's really helpful is actually the culture that is around mm. these agile methods. And this is just a screen grab of the key values and the manifesto. But I would sort of focus on the blue ones here and say, you know, this is actually what makes collaboration work so well is that people have the courage, the openness, the respect and the focus to actually make this happen. And I know, Steve, you and That's I right. mentioned that in our experience on the practical side, it is the softer skills that are just as important in the process. Very but nice. actually flagging this at the start of an agile process has been breakthrough for some of the clients I've worked with. Is it's given them permission to behave yeah. in a way that they know is going to be more collaborative. And this self-governing team and the empowerment of the team is part of what makes things like the agile methodologies of Scrum work. Because it says, yeah. stakeholder, we're keeping you informed, but we are making the decisions and we are going to go yeah. forward with this. So it's been really, really incredible in terms of that evolution process. Steve, did yeah. you, want to, did you want to add? Yeah, no. I was going to say, I think, uh, you know, uh, when, when we mention process, a lot of people go, oh, bureaucracy and have to follow it, and what have you. And in the past, maybe it was like that. But with these agile processes, it's not so much about the process and following a process, but the process gives you a framework to ask questions, to engage, to uh, come up with ideas. And it's more about the people. So uh, as a tip or technique, if anyone is implementing processes for collaboration or innovation or communication, spend only about 20% of the time teaching the process and 80% of the time on building the soft skills and the culture in order that individuals have that trust, respect, focus, openness, courage, what you've put there, because ultimately it's what happens with them that will make the difference, not the process. The process is only a guide, it's a framework. Absolutely. But it's the, it's the ability of individuals to work together to come up with something exemplary that actually will make the difference. And that is all through to the softer side. Go for it, Dave. One, one very small point to our previous, the last part of the discussion, which is 
I noticed that the scrum culture, just just be careful with your sports analogies. Um, <laughs> I remember American once sitting in a meeting. Scrums. Well, right. I once sat in a meeting in India where uh, uh, somebody from England was using, actually used the word scrum a number of times. And after about 15 minutes, somebody put their hand up and said, uh, who is Mr. Scrum? <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and actually, that's a nice segue. And we're not going to spend too long on this because we touched on it a fair amount with looking at working costs geographically. But um, the importance of understanding cultures and using things like Homestead's cultural dimensions when you enter into that collaboration with the market can lead you to really see how the structure is. So, for those of you that want to follow this up, I'm just giving you a little taster here to say look at these different markets they have different interpretations and if you take people power distance as the example here you can see the difference in the countries that are highlighted but this is all about hierarchy and um, you know how how people operate and behave so being sensitive and understanding things like that across the cultures as you say um, and yeah. we all probably have experiences of um I'm trying to remember the name of the Spanish car that was no go. It was a it was a name that they came up with and they hadn't tested yeah. in another culture, um, and it's translated as doesn't move. So yes, yes. absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's certainly where um, we all need to bear in mind for those three steps to heaven. So if that's yeah. all right, I'm going to keep the momentum because I want to be make sure that yes, indeed, guys. Um, and why COVID is super important. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of these slides that we've prepared, building on what you all heard in the announcements leading up to this session is that for, for all of us that um, enjoy change, you never let a good crisis go to waste. And what's wonderful about um, COVID is that actually it has seen people think about it in that way. And so I had a few examples in my world latterly in, in the last year that you may or may not be aware of, but we should celebrate is that actually the joint forces for Sanofi and GSK in terms of the vaccines, and, and that's a fantastic thing. But maybe you didn't realize that early on when there was a crisis of food service and delivery and food service had collapsed and was all going to grocery, Tesco and Sainsbury's shared their vans. You know, they actually shared their distribution together to get to each other's stores. In, in other markets, drones were being used to deliver medical supplies. And then from a personal perspective, there were some lovely examples, like in the care homes that were ring-fenced for um, health purposes, crane operators offered their services to hoist relatives at the other side of the window so they could actually see them, it makes them go already. Um, and likewise, the creativity and collaboration around wishing people happy birthday by driving down the road consecutively past their properties. So we're in a unique environment where we need to look for these things and build on them because this is the, the greatness that's happened about collaboration. And, you know, I do think that um, we're seeing it everywhere. I mean, I actually just got um, my Harvard Business Review here, which is, you know, when to work with rivals. It's all around us, guys, the, the idea of collaboration and the opportunity to partner. So we go through, and this is really just to demonstrate that we have to recognise that individuals do go through a curve of denial all the way through to engagement. And so hopefully a lot of us are further down this. I like to say it's the world's simplest segmentation at the moment, where people are on this axis of fear versus kind of looking at things in a balanced, commonsensical way. So we've got to work with the environment we are in terms of collaboration going forward. So let's talk about um, the successful dynamics of collaboration. And this is where we want to have a bit more of a discussion. So I know that you will have an opportunity to get access to these slides after and we'll be able to follow up on some points. But I want to make use of the time that we have and really sort of say that we don't really need to tell you this, guys, but it's a really important thing that people have recognised. They recognise that if you do collaborate, you can save time. People have changed their way of thinking and they're ranking it as super important in terms of the way forward. But what they're also saying is that enthusiasm often isn't enough. So actually, are we doing it? And that's to your point, Steve, is that whilst it's seen as super important, we've had this key point of reassessment with COVID, we'd be big advocates of saying, 
that at the moment people aren't collaborating well and they need to put some focus into it. And you'd be amazed at the results because employees and employers through these times have been thrown into, as you described, Steve, the tech world to collaborate. And actually it's become higher up the agenda. So this is a good news, but there's more, more to do. So to the point of our session is the only way to get things done today is in teams. So hopefully we've set the uh, framework there to say why we've seen it happen successfully, why we've seen it happen unsuccessfully and why we need to get closer to it. So this is the model that we're going to refer to in the last section of our, our session today, which looks at um, a number of dynamics in a meta model uh, to actually see where, where you need to focus in order to be successful. Now, um, each of th this is all built just to give you a sense of reality against best practice, against latest thinking. And you can see there some of the books that you might recognize and some of the thoughts incorporated into the meta model. But actually what it does is each dynamic asks you to ask the right questions to identify what you should be focusing in on now. And it doesn't mean that you need to focus on all of them at the same time, all of the time. What it's actually saying is you yourself know what the context of your particular challenge and your collaboration needs are. And you may well also know where you're potentially not building a solid foundation. So these are the one or two areas to focus on um, going through. So if we sort of look at um, each of these, um, what we're saying is that with belief in a team, you need to have a sense of purpose and find the optimism and the will to succeed. Now, this model helps you look at what are the essential conversations and the things that we probably all said in our time, which is, you know, why is it worth doing? What, what happens if we don't do it? And belief is super important in terms of getting a collaboration to work. So as you said earlier on, Steve, those early on discussions, but the advocacy I'm making as well is that you can still stop and have these discussions part way down a project or a collaboration because it's super important that if you've identified something that is adrift that you do work with it so what we're going to do is we're going to take each one of these and we're just going to have a little bit of a discussion around what's important and so if we take for example involvement as our first one what you're seeing here is What's good about involvement? What happens when you get involvement? You get engagement, you get openness, you get respect. What happens if you don't is you get distracted, there's a level of defensiveness because people aren't as open and you get disrespect. So what's really practical about this is it's helpful for you in that it can actually say what's good and what's bad and give you that sense of the questions to ask yourself. So yes, I mean, essentially what I then want to do in this, in this bit is kind of bring to life, I guess, some collaborations that pull out each of these points and then talk a little bit about potential follow-up because we have, a, we have some free gifts to give away a little bit later Always on. good. Always good for free gifts, yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and guys, as you know, uh, chipping in as we go through. But um, this yeah. first one here is looking at um, involvement. And this is an example of um, O2, which is a telco um, in, in Europe, which is part of Telefonica. Um, and they worked with, um, with the health service in the UK to actually work with district nurse, um, the district nurse environment. And what they discovered is by using their tech, it sounds very simple, but people were missing appointments. People were not turning up on time and the recipients weren't always in because they didn't know exactly the point at which the person was coming. So that was one issue. The other issue was that they had very little control over the supplies of the medicines or the various equipment that would be associated and there was a lot of waste. So O2 worked with um, the UK government and the district nurses and they had an over 50% improvement in both of those measures. So effectively what happened is that people were then able to um, receive that person at the right time and then they reduced costs. So a very simple kind of partnership that shows yeah. how involvement can work. And Ali, I just wanted to just build on that because I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always, uh, I've always said really the last uh, three years, I've been very passionately uh, shouting that actually the patient or the individual is the best medicine that we can give 
if they are informed, if they are empowered, and if they're inspired. So actually, I'd like to give the industry a bit of a challenge. How can we make sure that our patients, our consumers, our customers are absolutely involved in our collaboration uh, uh, when we, we come to bring it to life? Um, because ultimately, we're here to improve their health outcomes. And therefore, they should be part of the collaboration team. So uh, this is a good example how this gets very close to that. But uh, I'd like to give that out as a challenge to the industry, how to make sure that patients and consumers are involved as part of your collaboration team. That could be really powerful. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I guess like in the interest of time, I'm just gonna pick one mm. other one from here, but I think this is, um, kind of super interesting in terms of how you can work with it. So I'm going to take uh, progress. And progress is something that when we come from the world of waterfall, we think, OK, we'll only show milestone progress at certain periods. But the point of working more agile is you do want to show progress more often and you want to bite things off and show that that collaboration is working or adjust it. So if I move to um, my progress one, which is uh, looking at the collaboration between McLaren, who we, we all know from the motorsport industry, and the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, which is a reasonably famous hospital um, in the UK. And we've all probably seen examples where they have shared their technology and it has influence, but this was a behavioral collaboration piece. So this was where, unfortunately, children were dying between the operating when they'd finished their operation to getting to intensive care just that few meters distance unfortunately children were perishing and what they did is they spent a lot of time in the operating theater making sure that each person knew what they were doing opening up the lines of collaboration and talking about how they needed to be really sure that their equipment had gone from one version to another really really swiftly mm. so there was a combination of things that they, they had improved a lot over the time, that, uh, that, but this was the, the last mile to really uh, make sure that they were efficient. And by doing so, they were able to reduce those uh, mortality rates dramatically. And so this is a lovely um, example of where they showed progress really quickly. You know, they showed collaboration, they opened up. There was a hierarchy in, for example, where the anaesthetist wasn't allowed to challenge the, the key doctor. So these things were broken down. So that those yeah. conversations came about to say, I'm seeing this, let's do that, let's let's work together and let's all know our part. It's a little bit like the lollipop man in the uh, pit stop, you know, you can't go yet because we're not all ready. It's that kind of approach that showed mm. the progress. And we all know that in that particular industry, they fine tune things to the nth degree. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So great example. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some lovely examples in here, guys, but I, I know that we have only a little bit of time left. So I yeah. wanted to make sure that I just highlighted that within this model, there are pulse checks where you as a team can look at where you stand on each of these dynamics. And you've got an opportunity then to see where you need to focus. Because at the end of the day, as a team, you want to take a couple of these and you want to focus in on those. So there are various practical tools, which I find super helpful with my clients to help people go in the right direction. And along with that is um, one of the things are cards. And one of the things about these cards is that they are available in a number of languages. So I, I know some of you guys have copies, but this is available in Chinese, in French, in Spanish, and in English. And what they do is they ask those questions that we were talking about, you know, why is this worth committing to? And they demonstrate some thoughts on the reverse that can help you as a team. So even if you lay out the cards on a table and ask the team to pick out the ones that they feel most concerned about, then you'll know immediately. So these very practical ways of picking out what particular dimension you want to work on. So as a bit of a nice surprise, uh, guys, for you on here is we've got um, a link there. And for a period of time, please feel free to play with these in your particular environment and see where it can yeah. help you. But Steve also has um, 20 packs ready to uh, give away to the first 20 that I think will coordinate through the rest of the team. And we'd love to hear how you get on with things to be able to follow that up. Okay, so for the first 20 emails, 
that we get requesting uh, one of these collaboration card packs. We'd be very happy to mail uh, them over. And we have them in two languages. We have them in Chinese and in English. Is that right, Alison? Yeah, that's right. But if, if you have a request from someone passionate that wants it in Spanish or French, I can do it from here. <laughs> Okay, so there you go. That's a, a little bit of an incentive to really have a look at your own uh, collaboration teams and projects with great. this tool. That's great. So I okay. appreciate that. Um, yes. You know, we've that's a whistle stop tool, guys. Um, but I wanted yeah. to make sure that we land on something practical, having had the good discussion about how useful it is and how important it's been for businesses to hit that viable, desirable, and feasible kind of sweet spot. Um, I haven't been watching the chat, I've been concentrating on my screen, so I'm happy now to open up um, for the last few minutes and then obviously hand back to um, Emma to, to wrap things up. Sure. But any okay. pertinent questions, Steve or Dave? Sure, there's uh, well, a couple of questions. Dave, I think, on. Uh, um, first of all, Emma, uh, it's Alison, I have to say, you've set a terrible standard now for future speakers who will now be expected to do giveaways. Um, <laughs> I have to remind them all of that. Uh, but well, that's great. Thank you very much. And, and I, I think the card idea is really, really good as a simple technique of just getting people around a table, as you said, and play with the cards to try and, try and sort out things and find out what people's priorities and worries are. Uh, one of the questions comes from Trevor, right? And Trevor asks us, what's the difference between cooperation and collaboration? Which is a probably a very good point. The difference between cooperation and collaboration. Okay. Well, Trevor would be in a great position to answer this, but um, yeah, I think I think he's laid that up for himself. But, you know. <laughs> in my um, one it, one is more passive and one is more proactive. So the collaboration piece is much more proactive, um, and therefore that's something that I would fully advocate is actually not to sit back and expect it to come to you. Um, and you know, whilst a lot of businesses, and let's not underplay this, they have very good structures and setups and values. And you know, if you think about the Johnson Johnson credo that is really inherent in there, mm. people behave in the way that actually builds collaboration automatically. That's the context is actually the proactivity. Okay, great. Thank you, Alison. Um, uh, Maria's actually uh, put some comments on here, which I think are really exciting uh, uh, to do with that challenge I put which is to put the consumer or the patient at the heart of your collaboration or your project. And here is uh, uh, maybe a ch another sort of request going out to all of you. If you have any best practice that can be shared across the industry where we could learn from this, that would be really great um, because I am absolutely sure that there are some real pearls out there where we could all learn and ultimately uh, deliver a much bigger benefit. Uh, but I would just give maybe one, uh, a couple of ideas in that we are all now virtually, everyone I know is walking around with one of these and collecting their biometrics and their data and they're also in some cases doing their gene testing and what have you. Wouldn't it be amazing that some of this can then be shared with our healthcare practitioners in a way that they can find better solutions for healthcare? So um, also, uh, you know, think about the way technology can help us to facilitate this interaction, putting the consumer at the heart of our collaborations. Great. Interesting point, Steve, because just yeah, go the last on. couple of weeks over the Christmas period, I've had to, uh, uh, you know, I'm here in Sydney. I don't normally live here. I live in Bangkok, but I've been stuck here for a few months because of COVID. And for the first time in 25 years, I had to go and find a GP. And I went into the GP's office and after about 10 minutes, he said to me, do you use devices to track any health things? And if you do, can I have a look at them and see what the numbers are? Wow. Um, and I found that Great. really interesting. So I don't carry one on my wrist, but on my phone, I have a, an app and I pulled yeah. up the app and he was going, oh, so I see you do this amount of exercise a day and is this normal? And, you know, and he was going back over the last six months looking at what my things on different criteria were. I found that Brilliant. really interesting. I said to him, do you do that all the time? Now, admittedly, he was a very young and very hip doctor, right? Yeah. And, and he said, yeah. yeah, I do. I just, uh, I figure people have got this stuff. So a lot of people won't share it, but some people do. So it's just- Fantastic. It's, yeah. You know, it's, it's a nice- Brilliant. Idea. Well done, Steve. 
Thank you. Right. Well, we've come to uh, the end of our time. Alison, thank you so much. That was uh, really, really uh, exciting. There's a lot of things to think about. And again, if you have any questions for us, please, uh, please let us know. But thank you, Ali. And I'll now pass over to Emma, who is going to tell us a little bit about what's coming up. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Alison, Dave and Steve, for such brilliant conversation, discussion and debate and an amazing start to our 2022 and beyond webinar series. Thank you all of you for joining us today for our kickoff. Um, before we sign off, I'd love to invite you to the next webinar in the series, which will happen on February 11th. Mental Wellness, a New Global Report, with Ophelia Jung, Senior Research Fellow at Global Wellness Institute. Now I'm just going to pass you on to Dave, who's just going to tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so again, thank you, Alison. That was fantastic. As a beginning of the series, uh, we're planning uh, roughly one a month. And the next month, we're going to talk to Ophelia, who is somebody I've known for about 10 years. She works for an institution based in New York called the Global Wellness Institute which is basically a, a body that brings together knowledge about the broad wellness industry. The important thing is that last, at the end of last year, they produced what is probably the first real report on what is the global mental wellness industry. So this looks at, quite conveniently, at the end of 2020, with all the mental stress that we've all gone through and everything that's been going on, it looks at the structure of the wellness industry in terms of what does mental wellness mean? What kind of businesses are involved with it? What, what are the size of those businesses? What are the growth areas? What are the areas of innovation happening within mental wellness? And what you're going to find is that Ophelia, who uh, has worked in gathering this data from uh, dozens of countries from around the world, from all sorts of categories, and then aggregating that to give us a really heuristic look at what mental wellness is around the world, what's happening and what's likely to happen in the near future in terms of growth areas. I think it's going to be really exciting. She's a great speaker and a lot of really new and innovative information on an area that, uh, you know, truthfully hasn't really been talked about a lot in terms of mental wellness and, and what's going on with that. So I think it'll be quite exciting. That's brilliant. So following this event, you'll all receive an invitation to register to join us for the next webinar um, and alongside that a recording of this webinar so that you can recap should you need to. On behalf of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy, uh, we'd like to say again a huge thank you to Alison, Dave and Steve for making this session so insightful and thank you to all of you for joining us today. We wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon and evening, and we hope to see you all again in February. Thank you so much and see you soon. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.